So I am super excited uh, to introduce, to be interviewing uh, Maya Luna. Many of you will know her, many of you might not know her work. She's a poet and an incredible teacher of feminine wisdom. She's had a massive impact on my relationship with my partner and the journeys we've gone on debating and exploring her work. Um, it's been extraordinary over these last couple of years. And so Maya, welcome, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. That was maybe the best introduction I've ever gotten. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Well, it's heartfelt. Um, yeah. My partner and I were never happier than we're chewing on a kind of complex bone around philosophy and spirituality and freedom. Never happier. And uh, so you have given us plenty to discuss. You know, it's been it. amazing. And I honestly, I find it, I find it, you know, rare for someone consistently to be stretching my perception in the way that you have. And so I'm really, really excited, but I wanted to reach out to you because when I think about divine femininity, the truth is I feel if I was asked to define it, in some ways, I think I could articulate it. Um, and, but if you ask me to define divine masculinity, I would struggle. I would really struggle. Um, and so I'm on a journey to, to understand um, like an, an applicable version of that and I don't think that should be defined by men it, it for me in in a balance coming together I want to get the voices of of gifted wise women on the articulation of that so that's one thing but the other thing is what I've seen is there are people I think hijacking the nar narrative of what divine masculinity is mm -hmm. and I'm really concerned about it because it doesn't speak to my heart. And more importantly, I'm, I'm really concerned about the fact it's actually, it's a backward step and it's profoundly misplaced. And yet it is convincing droves and droves of women to submit in ways that do not serve them or serve our evolution. And so that's the intention behind reaching out to you. Mm. And, um, and for us to explore into this unknown and see see together what 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 may come through us in this conversation yeah wow thank you so much for inviting me and this yeah this topic is really really dear to my heart it's something that i feel i've been initiated into um kind of decoding what's happening in the collective right now and some of the threads of confusion that are going on. So um, I'm really excited to talk about this. Um, should I just dive in? Yeah, let's go for it. All right. Well, the first thing that I want to name is that for a very, very, very long time, um, we have had a perception. Um, this is more like the, the traditional patriarchal gender roles that man or the masculine is um, tough, hard, um, invulnerable, um, and dominant, right? And we've seen the feminine or woman as soft, right? Submissive, weaker, in need of care, in need of holding, in need of protection. So essentially masculinity itself has been built on this notion of being anti-feminine, right? <laughs> like masculine is strong, feminine is weak. Masculine is invulnerable, feminine is vulnerable. And so to be a real man, you have to make sure that you are not uh, feminine, right? And so what I've been really playing with lately is that I think um, I think part of what is going on, I mean, there's many, many things going on, but there's a confusion around what the feminine is, right? It's like we've seen feminine as kind of just like a lesser, weaker version of the masculine, right? It's like, it's mm. just like the masculine, just softer, weaker, smaller, right? Mm. 
right? And 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 anyone who's like really um, kind of dove into um, the the pre patriarchal times on planet Earth, or the goddess, or the real divine feminine, we know that this like Kundalini Shakti is immensely powerful. This is like the most powerful nectar on the planet, right? It's the power of the womb. It's the power of the earth. It's the power of the life force that moves through us. It's the power of Eros. So it's extremely powerful, right? <laughs> So interesting that the feminine has been associated so long with weakness and vulnerability and being small. So what I see is part of the reason why this is gaining traction is because people are saying, you know, men have become too soft. They've become too watered down. They've become too nice. They've become too feminine, right? So there's the distortion right there. The idea that that is the feminine. Mm. Right. And so to not be that, you've got to become more um, dominant, more hard, more tough. Right. So here's the example that I like to give. Do you remember Prince? Yeah. All right. There's this saying that Prince was the only man who could like walk into a room wearing, you know, eye makeup and steal your girlfriend. Right? <laughs> and high heels, right? Yes. Yeah. So if you really tune into Prince, mm -hmm. he is a very rare example of a man who was channeling the goddess. He was channeling like the real deep serpentine goddess energy, not the patriarchalized idea of femininity, right? He wasn't like effeminate in that way. He was very masculine, actually. He was like a really hot man, you know, on his motorcycle. And he had that that presence, right? He was I mean, that's why w women would swoon for him. At his concerts, he would take three-point basketball shots, right, and get them every time. <laughs> right? right? So he's he's still demonstrating his masculine prowess, right? Yeah, he right? was very much a man. He had yeah. that masculine presence core, but he was integrated with the true feminine. So here's the thing. Mm. When men integrate the false feminine, Okay, the patriarchalized version of the feminine, it does depotentiate their masculinity. Because the patriarchalized version of the feminine is just the junior masculine. It's and, the masculine and the, the but weaker. And the freedom has been defined by some feminist tropes to, to be more like a man, right? So it's like neither of those, totally toxic. Agreed. That's right. Yeah. So when men actually integrate the real feminine, not the patriarchalized feminine, which is like, be weak, be soft, be a child, basically. And look, everyone needs to do inner child work. You know this. I mean, everyone has a right to be vulnerable and tender and all, all the whole spectrum of humanity. But what I'm trying to point to is that there seems to be this idea that when men get in touch with their feminine, that make that emasculates them, that makes them less of a man, that makes them less potent as a man. And what I'm saying is that that's the patriarchalized version of the feminine. Because when men really channel the goddess, when they really integrate the true feminine, like Prince, for example, right, very rare example of a man, their, their, their masculinity is not watered down in any way. It's actually extremely potentized. Yeah, I think that's, I think that feels really, really true. Fascinating. Yeah. So then it becomes this inquiry around, wow, we've had this concept of the feminine, you know, that's so deeply ingrained, right? And you and I were speaking about this before. It's kind of like, the masculine is the adult mm. and the feminine is the child. Yeah, right? the, daddy, the daddy rescuer, the Disney fantasy, right? Yes. And, and this is um, one of the oldest tropes and lies, you know, that's just been so programmed into the collective consciousness. And there is nothing about it that has any reality to it at all. And it doesn't support men either. Right, because then men are, right, expected to be these invulnerable, um, you know, machines that are just constantly right. If you're, if you have to be the adult all the time to someone's child, that's quite a burden. 
Yeah, totally. But also being invulnerable is quite a burden, right? Because exactly. not. So invariably what happens is your crown, your pristine crown slips, right? And as a man, men have felt themselves be vulnerable or lose their way or even trip, right? Mm. Like mm. the, the, if the president gets sick, not you can't say anything, right? No one can know he's got a cough or ill because it's just bad for PR, right? It's right. like you can't even get ill. Right. Right. I saw a marketing guy, Grant Cardone, the other day saying, like, if you're sick, don't post about it. Don't sick. You know, no one wants to work with someone who's ill. I'm like, it's just right. It's insane. Right. And that level of pressure is, mm. um, is really, is really, is really damaging. It's really toxic, obviously. Yeah. But, it's, but, but, you know, that as a young man, when, when my partner saw my crown slip and we were both programmed to think that I should have just, you know, not been that. It was so unbearable. Wow. So unbearable. And because wow. I was holding on to some semblance of power with so much tension that, of course, it was, it was fragile. And the rage that would erupt if I was seen, you know, right. as anything less than kingly, you know, it's oh, the wow. wounded prince who's not anywhere near. And I think there's a wound for men, a challenge for men, that, and, and women have a version of this where they are sexually attractive way before they're ready to be sexually active, right? And so then they have all sorts of awful energy coming at them from adult males, which is both interesting because they see they have power and they have mm. hope for the future. So it's not all terrible, but most of it is really repulsive because they kind of know those guys shouldn't be looking at them in that way, right? So it's terrifying for the world they're entering into. But men have their own version of that, which is we're meant to be strong, but at 12, we could be snapped like a twig by a real man. Mm. Mm. And, and that period of time is really unbearable because we just feel like we, we are, we're not up to speed. We're not a man. And yet wow. we know to be a good man, we should be strong, but we're not, we could be yeah. snapped. And that's, I think the shadow of that, the powerlessness and the threat of that yes. plays out where at any time we can then have dominion or domination. Yes. So, to prove to ourselves that we're now powerful, to get over that shadow time of our weakness, you know? Wow, wow, wow. That's really insightful. And, you know, as I hear you speak about it, I just think about, um, you know, this programming around that the genders, man, woman, or now we have this kind of rebooting of the spiritual essence of masculine and feminine <laughs> <laughs> has something to do with domination and submission right? Which is um, such bullshit. <laughs> like, I mean, really, like, there's, there's nothing of it. There's no reality to it. Um, it's a, it's a really toxic system that has created so much harm on this planet in for the souls of men and women and and the earth. Right. And one of the things that I like to say is that, um, so this idea of hierarchy, right? Hierarchy is a very, what I would call masculine way of knowing and perceiving reality. And there's nothing wrong with hierarchy, actually. Like some people are like anti-hierarchy, like we should get rid of it and we're all yeah, yeah, equal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what I see is that feminine wisdom, which is what I would just call like the organic wisdom, like the wisdom that is in tune with um, the ecosystem of life yep. and, our, and our place in the ecosystem of life, which includes each other, which includes the earth, which includes a more attuned, embodied listening to the moment rather than just perceiving with our minds. Grounded. It's right? Better, right? Yeah. So if we're in that field, Dominance and submission, or if we could maybe use a gentler term, you know, leading and following, yeah. te teaching and learning, it does arise sometimes. Sometimes I hold you, sometimes you hold me. Sometimes I've got the wisdom and the power in a moment, sometimes you do, and then I'll submit and I'll listen and I'll receive, right? And sometimes none of that exists. Sweet. So the idea that to be a man or a woman or to be masculine or feminine, we need to maintain <laughs> this <Hey>. never ending. <laughs> insane, right? And it's so, so dangerous. So my partner and I, we have this beautiful thing where if one of us is upset, 
you know, we come in for a hug and sometimes we both go and it's like, no, 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 I need to go small. And we're like, okay, you go small this time, right? And so then they're held and they're small and it yeah. goes 50, 50. So one year I might be going small more often than she is, right? And it's not all of me, but it's just a moment where I, I'm holding the young tender part of me. And if I can be held in that for that moment, then it's yeah. the better chance to be worked through, to be felt, to be analyzed to be liberated, to be integrated, right? That makes me more powerful, more free, Absolutely. more fluid, right? Not, com not compelled by my conditioning or my trauma, right? And so it, this interplay, everything that I'm feeling into is that so many of this idea of the traditional archetypes of the, even the king and the queen, you know? And it's, it's like, for me, it's like, I, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that they're smeared with patriarchal ideology in the essence and I I posted something about kingship the other day and someone was like it's the head of a monarchy I was like well I'm not really on about that but I get it it's charged now I think we need new terminology you know and the archetypes must have evolved I'm not sure the four male archetypes the main ones were that relevant to cavemen so if they have evolved out of that what are they evolving to and the only thing that I am feeling is this being that is beyond the conditioned identity of being one or the other and is able to move between all of it in any given moment you know and it's the idea that you're right like fixing these are the attributes right of the penis holder you know and it's like it's just yeah. insane right and it, but I guess for me the thing I I when you run into someone who's kind of just of the patriarchal, like just they're chauvinistic, they're brought up that way, but they don't know any better. And I just, it feels awful. But for me, the thing that is really, really bothering me is the movement of people who are co-opting people who are into personal development. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they want the answers about the evolutionary move. Mm -hmm. And there is a massive movement of men preaching the the if you know a man is only a man if he isn't questioned and that woman can must submit she cannot question him she cannot challenge him she cannot she cannot ask she can't even make a request yes right yes. if like the, according to some of the rules that have been put out there by these models it's like she cannot even make a request the idea being if he's a decent man he will want to serve you and mm -hmm. therefore he will be passionate about what you're interested in and he mm -hmm. will look for interesting ways to look after you and you should just trust daddy that he's going to be okay <laughs> and you can lie back in your princess fantasy and be have all your needs met and you don't need to worry your pretty little head about it right I mean, well <sighs> here's the thing anyone who has studied um narcissistic abuse knows that step one in a, in, if you're being um, groomed by a true abuser, step one is going to be that they um, convince you that they're going to love you like no one has ever loved you. They're going to take care of you and be the parent to your child like no one has ever been the parent to your child. They are going to cocoon you in an idealistic um, fantasy of unconditional love and serve your every whim. That is 100% um, how the consciousness of abuse always begins. It begins- Love bombing with phase, right? Yes, the love bombing and grooming phase. Yeah. And so, um, you know, the, the, I like to refer to, to patriarchy as kind of like an entity, actually. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a, it's a thought form in the collective. Okay. That has a lot of energy and juice behind it. And it's connected to um, the abuse of women, the domination of women, the domination of earth, the abuse of earth, right? It's all connected. And this little virus, this little entity, um, it just gets smarter <laughs> and evolves over time. So variant. The polarity yeah. movement is a, is a toxic masculine variant. Is that what you're it, telling me, Maya? It oh is 100% a variant. Ah. Ah. And I, I know this because, um, you know, I, I have seen behind the scenes how abusive um, these teachings actually are and how dangerous they are to the women that get involved with them. Um, it's hard, isn't it? Because when something works a bit, mm -hmm. it can be incredibly convincing. 
right? So like yeah. you say, for men who haven't been masculine enough and for women who haven't probably been feminine enough or for whatever reasons, but that, you know, something early on that works a bit, it can be so convincing that this is the thing. And of course, it, it, I mean, even, even if, if some of that, that model was great, the fact that it just leaves a back door open for just vast amounts of abuse to go undetected and for women to be oppressed, exploited. It shouldn't even be allowed just because it's so risky, even if it was a good model, right? Because in the hands of a bad man and a woman who's submitting without question, yeah. the, the capability of gaslighting, control, and exploitation, it shouldn't even be allowed just because of the risks for the vulnerable. That's right. Well, and that's another thing that, you know, you can tell that it's actually an abuse model because I have never seen anyone who teaches this to actually educate people about what abuse is, right? If they were, if they were educating and saying, Hey, this is what abuse is because abuse is very, you know, the, it's very complex, actually the system of abuse with the gaslighting and the manipulation and like the way that abuse con consciousness works mm -hmm. is actually very um, subtle and covert. Sometimes it's uh, it's, it's really something that's important to understand really? and there's no education happening, none. So they're yeah. not saying, Hey, we're different than that. And this is how we're different. And this is how you can No, they're, they're not doing that at all. And you know, these are people that are that are abusing their partners behind closed doors like and i and i know this because their partners come to me and tell me so it's a disaster actually it's a real backward step and it's a really really it's a, yes. it's a profoundly risky one and it's so let's uh, talk about why it's attractive maybe yeah and bring that down yeah, why is it sure. attractive <laughs> well, I, I mean, you know, I mean, when I was younger, when I was younger, right, and if I was um, like making love to my partner, I wanted to do a good job and I wanted to make them happy and and I was in the flow and if they, and I'm embarrassed to say it now, but if they were like, oh, could you slow down or could you maybe try this or my ego system just, it just felt that that direction meant mm. that I was getting it wrong. And I was very ready in my own wounding as the unloved little boy, you know, I wasn't pleasing. And therefore any direction made me feel connected to my, in, in my certain, in my vulnerability. And then sometimes I would literally, I couldn't get back to being sexual. I would be angry. I'd feel the mood was lost. I would blame them. They ruined it. It was going fine. Now I don't want to. And it was just go super awkward. I mean, awful, awful. Wow. Thank and, you for sharing that. That's really I, so I'm awful. And yeah. it's like, and I know, and I know from helping lots of men and women now, there are lots of women who will be in bed and they'll be like, God, I wish you'd just do this, but I'm not gonna, I don't want, I don't want to say anything, I don't want to get in the way of their stride. And all the tantra training and the consent and the direction. And for me, that empowers you to be expressed and to know what someone wants and everyone's different. It's like when you're mm -hmm. confident in yourself and relaxed in yourself, guidance is just like, this is who I am in this moment. And you're like, oh, nice to meet you in this moment. Mm -hmm. I, of course I want to know what you want because I'm here to, to dance with you and your, your waves. And it's like, mm -hmm. and, and that to me is maturity, you know, and it's evolving and will continue to evolve. But it's like, I understand mm -hmm. what my 20 year old to find a model where it's like, you're the big man. And she just has to trust you and surrender to you. And then you will never be questioned. You know, it's like men who don't want to stop and ask for directions because they don't want to be seen that they don't know where they're going, but they don't know where they're going. Right. So, so the idea is that to be a real man, you have to always be right and always be on top. And always know. Mm -hmm. I can imagine more ridiculous you know it's like that you know that our, our authority is based that we know what's happening and we know what to do yes. and it's like boy, you know the, my first step into power is like I know nothing I'm available I'm listening I'm going to go with what's coming up right yeah. so and, that's what I would call feminine wisdom right yeah. so when we're dropped into our bodies, and this has been the legacy on planet Earth, is that um, what what I actually call patriarchy is is more. It's so much more than gender dynamics. It's a legacy on the planet 
where human beings have been disconnected from the feminine, from the true pulse of the feminine, which we only can contact when we're really low in our bodies and receiving the moment, right? And making embodied contact with the present moment. So what happened was human evolution, our center of gravity moved from our body up into our, our head. And quite literally with that came the advent of the written word mm. and then the domination of logic, the rational mind. With that came the Abrahamic religions. So moving away from the goddess and the earth to God up in the sky, the transcendent. And then with that came misogyny and then the domination of women. And it's all connected. It's mm. all connected to our embodiment. So I love when you speak about this movement that you have made as a man from starting out as all males do with this assumption that if I'm to be a real man, I have to always know, I have to always be in control and I have to always be on top. I have to always be dominating situation. Yeah. And then you've evolved into recognizing, oh wait, real power is when I rest into my body, into I don't know and meet the moment and let life move through me. Yeah, that's exactly. what I call the goddess. That's the true feminine. Yeah. And, you know, my partner, she's always saying, you know, it's like how I run my business, how I run my container. I don't have any plan. I have no agenda. I have no... people like, what are we going to do? I'm like, we're going to turn up. We're going to see what's there. And, and it's like, I might run an eight day training. I, I know what to talk about around healing in a child. And I've got a whole bunch of tools, but I wait, I pull them off the shelf as and when based on what's happening. Right. Yes. And uh, I don't give my people enough flow diagrams. And for some people that like to know what's the system, they go crazy with my way of working. But but it's so, like, okay, can I can I just reflect something really really quickly? So sure. I just, I just want to circle it back to what I was naming before because this is what I would call a man who has integrated the feminine and has integrated embodying the feminine. Well, and what you're describing has nothing to do with being vulnerable and weak and soft. No, you're kidding me. That's my superpower. It's yes. like, I, I mean, I learn on the job. Like if I can send her into that, it's like someone asks a question. And I'm like, and I speak to it and I'm like, I am learning on the job. Like what is coming through? I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Okay. Right. You're like, my understanding is evolving with their understanding. And I, and I constantly work on them not also then projecting some kind of deified power on me i'm like this is just what happens if you get deeply present with a clear intention to serve and you get away from your conditioning and you're not acting from trauma then you become a fluid channel through which incredible understanding can move right that's it and and it's and it can be astounding and it doesn't just it's not just what you're saying but also the quality with which you say it is resonant in a way where it will impact and create transformation because that vibration of those things lining up goes straight past the conscious limitation and their unconscious says that's true. And if you can speak to the unconscious and say, you blamed yourself when, because you'd rather blame yourself as a child than admit your parents let you down because that would have been more traumatic in that moment, but it wasn't true. Mm. In that one moment, their life can be transformed because that truth dissolves the need to sabotage and push love away and avoid commitment and intimacy it's just like and so it's entering into that state but i'm curious about i'm curious about i like so much of what has been beautiful has been this feminine healing stuff we're talking about and it's like i'm kind of curious about what part of the masculine is what part of the masculine once it's not toxic like what are the qualities of that that part of the pole mm -hmm. are also deeply healing you know mm -hmm. it's like i'm tr i'm curious about that because i'm i'm not going to i don't want it to i don't think it could be true that all of the really beautiful healing cosmic stuff is just in the feminine that seems preposterous right and it's like so <laughs> but i like i don't totally trust yeah the, the masculine mm -hmm. like I, I my nice guy when, and for me, transcending my nice guy was really important. I had to embrace my inner dominant, you know? It's like one of my favorite role plays my partner over the years has been bad guru, right? 
bad mm. therapist where you completely exploit someone, right? So that's mm. terrible shadow, really naughty, right? Mm. But, so it's been really healthy for me to get in touch with the part of me that would like to completely exploit and dominate, right? Mm. Because I was too nice. And I had to play into that. Right. So actually that has made me way less likely to want to dominate. Mm. Way less likely to want to exploit, you know? Mm. And, and And so that enables me to integrate the aspect of what I would call my primal you know caveman right Mm. who's possessive proprietorial territorial you know bonkers Mm. right Mm. (laughs) but but put my arm around him i thank him for his service historically you know yeah and not run my life from that place of scarcity and control right which is toxic Mm. but then what's what i want to excavate is what are the what are the elemental aspects of masculinity Right. That are healing. Mm. And I'm, I'm, that's, you know, mm. I'm curious about that. Yeah. Well, oh gosh, there's so many interesting angles to go from here. I mean, the first thing that I want to say is that in my body of work, I'm less focused on masculinity and femininity, femininity as things that men and women should embody mm-hmm. and more like dimensions of reality. So like I said, right, human beings used to be more, um, their center of gravity was lower in the body, Mm. right? Uh, And that was when we were in touch with the earth and in touch with the goddess and in touch with this different quality of wisdom that for the most part we've lost touch with. And you and I were just kind of exploring that a few minutes ago, right? This, This kind of opening to the power of the moment and letting this different quality of intelligence pour through us. So that's the feminine, right? Mm. The center of the head, right, is to know, right? This is the masculine up here, right? It's to know, it's to claim, it's to view reality in an objective way and bring through that brilliance of the mind, you know? Um, And again, this isn't about men. No. But I think it's important to, like, honor that. Like, fuck yeah, we have patriarchy has not been only toxic it has given us philosophy and logic and awareness of the transcendent and um consciousness and awareness based revelations you know these are these are exquisite expressions of what i would call the masculine dimension of reality you know and um those are worthy of being acknowledged and celebrated you know yeah. Um, all of that, all of that divine order, maybe we could say. Mm. Um, yeah, and the divine articulation and analysis of, yes. you know, and sometimes that, and again, this is not men and women, but that pristine ability to understand and articulate mechanics, yes. right? The mechanics of a thing, right? Yes, that is the power of the masculine. So here's what I would say to your question. The healing masculine is the quality in us that uses that power to serve life rather than dominate life, Mm -hmm. right? That's using that capacity um, in service to the goddess, in service to life, in service to the feminine, Mm -hmm. rather than maybe our own sense of importance and you know, right? Like I've got this, uh, I've got this articulation and like, I'm so great because of it, <laughs> right? Maybe that's the, the distorted masculine. Bring me my 200 concubines. Yes. yes. yes so maybe that's the dis- distorted masculine in all of us. And, and the pure healing essence of the masculine is like, oh no, I'm going to articulate this and name this and penetrate this open in service to life. Right? In service to truth. Yeah, that feels clear. That feels clean. Yeah. And I notice, and I notice how, you know, I, I'm t- I get tired of the pendulum swing of human evolution, right? So we're like, this has been bad over here, so we need to rebalance it. And so therefore, you know, it's, we're, you know, we're going to, it just moves over too far the other way, right? And it, then it moves it, and it's just like for me, I'm interested in when the pendulum stops swinging between the two, 
right? Uh, what's the what's the center point? You know, that's the evolutionary step. You know, it's like the things we do to to rebalance some of the oppressions just further establish imbalance because we're bringing the same the same energy. You know, and so it's like, and I get so I get concerned and frustrated about this in terms of white male privilege right mm -hmm. understanding that there has been white male privilege but to yeah. to categorize white men in any way which is mm. generalized mm. is bigotry mm. the very mm. thing that we're trying to move away from right mm. that every individual man black or white and and woman of any or any person identifying in any way we yeah. have a responsibility to look at our prejudice and to look at our privilege and of course yeah. but as soon as we're clumping people together and going boo you know and the, you know it's just it's just for me it's oh it's just gonna take another 500 years can we not just move to the middle point mm -hmm. yeah i see what you mean i guess why i went down that route was because actually when you articulated so well what what is beautiful about the masculine mm -hmm. it felt rare right now mm. that felt rare mm. and whilst we are rebalancing toxic masculinity mm -hmm. for me it's more important to articulate divine masculinity than it is to say no to toxic masculinity right or at least right. equally important and that balance is off that's why i'm now having worked mainly with women for 22 years working on inner child healing yes i'm interested in in, in working with men and when I funny, when I first th thought about it, I was like, oh, am I going to have to get spears and start practicing shouting at fires, you know, <laughs> because of my own crazy prejudice, you know, and so much of the men's work is about, you know, rattling spears and shouting at fires naked. And for some men, they need that, right? They need to get into their warrior and their strength. But I realized it's like, that's not my skill. I'm yeah. a, I actually facilitate as a masculine male, but I facilitate from the feminine. And my work is about putting men in touch with their feelings and their trauma well people and now i'm going to be i don't know how to market that to men yet we'll see but right. it will probably have to be different i might have to get them through the door on the base of making more money in their life or having better sex but once right. i've got them there i'll explain that the key to that evolution is their trauma and so yes. I'm, i went through this idea thinking i need to do different work it's like no my work is is my content and my mission and my speciality is it's mm -hmm. powerfully and effectively healing trauma and that's what men need it's their pain and their mm -hmm. sense of powerlessness and their trauma and and you know a lot of men were brought up you know by women that were very very angry with the men in their lives mm -hmm. and as mm -hmm. little boys experience an awful lot of emasculation and anti-masculine sentiment right it's not you know it's, right uh, finally there's a man there that can be molded and be made slightly less like a man. Right, right. You know? Okay. So, so those patterns. there's a lot here that I would love to speak to. Great. <laughs> so so the first kind of little bit that I transmitted there was about what I would call more like the masculine and feminine layers of reality, right? And celebrating like the brilliance of the mind and to know and to objectify reality and to grasp and understand and map out and the transcendent and all of that. Praise be Shiva, right? Mm -hmm. All hail <laughs> the divine masculine. But let's take it down a little more nitty gritty into man, right? What is a man? What is a man? And what is a masculine man, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the gender roles that have kept men and women hostage, right? that have objectified men and women, this is one of the the negative sides of having our center of gravity be the head and the mind and the capacity to objectify reality rather than intimately meet reality is this mass objectification of the genders. Right? So for men, um, right, just as you were saying, it's sort of like to, to break out of that prison cell to free themselves into like, I'm a human being. I'm not just like a man, right? Quote unquote, I'm a human being. They've got to integrate what's been denied and rejected, which is grief, pain, right? 
Okay, so this is what's been denied from men, like you were saying. Um, all of this pain, all of this trauma, all of this wounding that men have been taught to suppress and not feel and just pretend I'm tough, I don't care, I'm tough, I don't care, I'm strong, I don't care, right? So for women, it's the opposite, it's anger, right? That's, that's the caricature of a feminine woman. Just like a masculine woman is a man that doesn't feel grief and pain, a feminine woman is a woman that doesn't feel anger, that doesn't advocate for herself, that puts other people before herself. So for women to free, right, to free themselves, to liberate themselves from the gender prison, um, it's getting in touch with their anger. And for men, I would say getting in touch with their grief. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'd love to tell a story really quickly. Um, sure. My housemate um, hired a man like off of Craigslist or something to do some landscaping for us. Mm -hmm. And so um, this guy comes over and he's doing this landscaping and he's taking care of our yard. And uh, we didn't have that much interaction with him, but we were just you know really polite and nice and had a few words exchanged. And he was there a few hours and then he left. And then he called us after he left sobbing because he was in so much pain in his life and he felt he had nowhere to go to share this pain and have this pain be seen and because we showed him this like morsel of kindness and presence mm -hmm. you know he felt something in us that could hold it yeah. he was just like basically begging us like please like i have to be seen in this pain right. sobbing I have nowhere to go. I can't tell anybody. That is the story of so many men walking this earth right now. I mean, men commit suicide at I don't even know how many times greater the rate than women. Yeah, I think it's, yes, yeah, at least six, I think. It's, yeah. Yeah, this is not okay. And so now we have the the supposed, you know, conscious people helping us to like evolve and 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 expand and grow. And they're saying, go right back into the box, men. Stuff your pain, stuff your vulnerability, stuff your weakness, stuff your grief, and be a real man. That's insane. That's it's toxic. Like to the bone. <laughs> Yeah. yeah yeah and you know i plan to to i'm rallied to confront it and so i'm really pleased that we're having this conversation it's it's um, yeah. renewing my vigor to, because i think we have a responsibility if we have yes. any kind of community to protect people from that messaging but also to be a a a visible counterpoint to that story so that people who are going down that path understand that it is an opinion not a truth and that it's and it's something they should deeply, deeply question. And if those people in power are not open to debate and not willing to be challenged, or there's yeah. no space for questioning without them being shamed and for being non-feminine women, then they should run as far as they can. <laughs> That's right. right? <laughs> well, and let's and let's look at it this way, you know, like all the men that I've known who truly love women and like really appreciate women and appreciate the feminine, they love the crone, the dakini, the oracle, the wild woman, the wise woman. They love all of those facets of woman, not just the maiden, the little girl. So what these polarity teachings are doing is they're saying that the maiden and the little girl archetype which is naive, submissive, surrendered, soft, meek, yeah, sweet, yeah. that that is the true feminine. And if you want to be in your feminine, you have to be that all the time. So that is absolutely a predatory tactic um, to dismantle the protective um, mechanisms in a woman and keep her in a manipulatable state, right? So that's, to me, that's not a man who loves women. That's a man who wants to um, manipulate and dominate women. 
manipulate and dominate and even but like the the thing that i'm most well concerned about is so many people i almost have more respect for a person who is like i am exploitative and that is my plan and i have a machiavellian (laughs) evil plan and i am enacting it right but so (laughs) few people go to bed thinking that right they're like uh, this is what makes it work for me. I, this is the type of man I am, this type of woman I want. And they don't, they're not going to bed thinking themselves narcissists. They are, they are going to bed thinking they've crafted a model, which if everyone could just follow, everyone would be fine. It's like, it's, mm-hmm. it's, that's yeah. the most dangerous thing about it. Right. That, you know, the ex- exploit from conditioning, which is not grounded in an understanding that it is, that they are being toxic. Yes. I have more respect for someone who's like, I am a toxic you know other gangsters I've known in my life they know they're bad men right, <laughs> right. that they, they make a business out of being terrified on purpose yeah. so that they are above the law that's the whole psychology of a gangster is like I right. will it's not worth your while mm-hmm. to try and control me because yeah. generations of your family will regret it so right. you don't call the police right <laughs> that's their business they're evil and they work hard at being evil and they're really good at it right have, actually I don't want to hang out with them and I would like them to be prevented from doing wrong, but I actually have more respect for that than someone who, because it's actually, they're in their integrity. There's someone who in a deluded sense, they're not ethical, but they're whole. Yes. People are like, they're not going, ha, 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 I get to exploit the feminine. They just walk yes. around thinking this is the way to have domestic harmony. Yes. Well, this is actually a really powerful point that I think is important, um, which is this is something that took me a while to really understand, which is that in the psyche of um, a misogynist, right, which we could we could say that like some men really embody that, but we could also just look at this as kind of like an entity, like a thought form that has been floating around for a long time, right? Yeah. It's, it's like they actually literally see women as slaves, actually. Like, that's the mentality, right? They, they don't see women as people. Mm-hmm. And their idea of love, <laughs> right, is a very twisted um, kind of controlling, objectifying possession. Right. It took me a long time to, to realize that. And I think it connects to what you're saying, because. There are so many things like this. I mean, I think racism is, is a similar consciousness, too. Um, so it's not that they're hiding the fact that they're toxic. They don't even understand that they're toxic. I mean, look at like what's happening in Afghanistan, you know, women being shot in the streets for showing, you know, a portion of their knee or something. They don't think that that's abusive. That's right. It's like you don't think it's bad to put your dog in a kennel when you go to work because it's a dog. That's how they think of women. And it took me a long time to actually understand that. Right. But it's but it's also, you know, it's also and this, this makes it almost worse. It's the feminine, the collateral damage of a man being disconnected from his own feminine. It's like yes. they're not tuned into that frequency. So That's they don't right. value it in their lives. It's an alien frequency. So they don't understand it and they don't That's see right. the value in it. So That's of right. course you're, you're, you're a secondary valuable thing because you're, yes. you're, you're full of the values that they have actively suppressed and think of as being bad, right? It's just- 100%. And so it's this, which is why it's so heartbreaking when there are people who are investing time and money in their spiritual and personal evolution, that there's this whole movement which has co-opted people's unresolved inner child issues of yes. being the unquestioned prince and, yes. the, and, the, and the ever served sweet princess by the rescuing daddy. You know, it's like I said before, I think it's dark Disney, you know, and it's like, Dark yep. Disney in the ma- in in the Matrix or in the in in the mainstream is awful, mm-hmm. but understandable as mm-hmm. being as being blind prejudice, which we should do everything with compassion and love to educate. But mm-hmm. when people are standing on stages charging people an awful lot of money using psychology and emotion, you know, just all the things we know that, that can be done right. 
to peddle this toxic nonsense. Right. It's, yeah. It's not okay. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of um, trauma, you know, I think this is part of it too, is that um, trauma tends to create eros in the body, right? Wherever there's trauma, the body tends to create some kind of eroticism around that trauma as a, as an intelligent way of, um, it's kind of just the organic intelligence of life saying, go here, this is where healing needs to happen. So I think that's part of the power of the polarity teachings too, or the appeal is that we have a mass legacy of trauma of women being dominated and raped, right? And pillaged by, by men, right? This is, this is a legacy that lives in our DNA, our great, great grandmothers, our great, great, great grandmothers, right? This legacy of rape on the planet. And so when that, I mean, this is edgy. Like I realize this is edgy to talk about because I think a lot of people are like, don't take that away. <laughs> I want to keep my hot, <laughs> you know, <laughs> dominant submissive sex. Like it's hot and I like it. So you don't mess with it. And like, I get it and I understand it, but I think we have to acknowledge that part of the reason why there's so much charge there is because there's generations of trauma behind it. I agree. Not just for women, but for men too. Totally. Because being the one that's in war, killing and raping and pillaging, because that's your duty as a man, is to be the warrior and kill and murder and rape and pillage. Yeah. Oh, well, that's people, fucking traumatic. Deeply. And, and anytime we experience trauma, one of the first defenses is to normalize it, right? Yeah. You, you normalize it. Because if you normalize it, it's not so bad, right? But if you normalize it, the, the drive to repeat it is profound. That's right. The drive yeah. to repeat it is profound. So, just, just so like, we need to have compassion and acknowledge that we have these impulses to engage in this way in the daddy daughter, dark Disney dominant submissive thing. We need to acknowledge that we yeah. not make it wrong, but also understand that just because there's charge and energy there doesn't mean that it's some glorified, like, divine union tantric truth of the masculine feminine that's really yeah. the problem here it's hot like dark side right it's hot dark side right <laughs> you know which which you know once you've processed the trauma that might be driving some of that eros that's actually right. you can still enjoy role play and interplay and i i was very snooty about snm many many years ago and i was speaking to a friend and i was ranting about how it's just like wounded inner children Mm -hmm. who are connected to I'm a bad little boy or I'm a bad little girl spank me you know and my friend went you're an idiot he's like you don't know enough you should go and try it. go and do this course my friends were not until right? you tried it yeah right and <laughs> and he said of course there are people there with unresolved inner child issues who are who are acting out there of course that happens and they shouldn't right and they should know better but that's true in every office in every restaurant it's like that's going to happen everywhere right yeah. And, and I went on this course and I did my best to, to, to leave my prejudice at the door. And, and what I learned was beyond all of that, of course, there's an incredible magic around being submitting to dominance mm. and the edge of fear and, mm. the, and, and then the actual consent and learning how to do it safely and expressing all of that and how healing all that stuff can be, right? Absolutely. But Absolutely. it's, um, but yeah, just... It's maybe similar to what I was describing earlier around the difference between fixed hierarchy and dogma and mm. fluid connected to the moment, connected to presence, mm. hierarchy and dogma is that if we, if we really drop into presence in sex where we're not in our heads, we're not in a fantasy, we're not in a projection, we're not in a story, we're really, really in our bodies in the moment letting life touch us, letting the current of life and arrows move us, then um, yeah, those, those animalistic primal, you know, dom sub spaces might arise, right? Yeah. But in a very fluid, organic way. And not being driven ultimately by a desire to dominate because we're still a wounded kid that wants his toy and doesn't want to share it, right? And, or any yeah. other variety of possibilities. So 
in that present state, you're right, as a, like a radio transceiver, you move the knob, you'll go through a whole bunch of different radio stations, right? Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And, oh, yeah. you know, and for a moment, oh, yeah. <laughs> two songs of S&M might just be the ticket for a while, right? And then yeah. it moves into something different, right? And it's... Yeah, then suddenly you're laughing or together or you're crying or you're in penetrative stillness or, you know, all kinds of different flavors that arise. And then that's healthy, right? And that's, I mean, any model that that dictates fixedness is worrying for me, right? So that's the that's the toxic masculine. That's the out of balance masculine. It's is the, the is known. The rigidity. Yeah. It stays still. I've got it in a compartment. I've I've labeled it. I've that's described right. it. I know what it is. I know what it does. Yes. I can sleep tonight. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I put nature in a box. The chaos is over. Yes, I've I'll, conquered. I'll, Ultimately, <laughs> in the in the pure heart of the masculine desire for control, it's the terror of chaos, right? Yes, right? that's it's, right. It's the terror of chaos. That's right. And yeah. every, you know, it's like let's not. What if we don't find enough nuts tomorrow? So why don't we? Why don't we start growing them in one place where we know we can get them tomorrow? Mm. This hunter gathering is exhausting. It's a you know mm. it's. Mm -hmm. and uh yeah. and so as soon as we started cultivating right we yeah. were lost right that's when it all began actually yeah that and the advent of the written word that was the big the great turning of patriarchy right um but you know it's it's interesting when you say that because this is a big part of my teachings actually is that you know on this planet we live in the goddess Right. It might be different on other planets and other frequencies and other realms and other dimensions, but on this, she's actually dominant. <laughs> like she's she's actually right. This chaos that you talk about, this fact that we live in a wild jungle of reality and groundlessness and constant change and impermanence. This is the goddess. This is the feminine. We don't know when we're going to die. We're all going to die. Could be any time. We don't have full control over what happens. We have some agency, but not total agency. Right? And what I've seen is that most spirituality and personal self-development is a way to try to deny and cope with that fact because we are terrified of the feminine. We have lost in our losing connection with her in sinking into the systemic ecosystem of life and our embodied connection to what I call the deep feminine current of reality. We have become so afraid of this wild, pulsing, undulating, you know, the wildness of her. Like we live in the jungle. <laughs> yeah, we put these concrete boxes around it, right? To try and yes. pretend we can control it. We try to pretend we can control it. And so mm. what happens when we turn towards, you know, and find a different way of dancing with the goddess rather than dominating and conquering, which is futile anyways. No one, no one conquers. Mm. No. no one, no. <laughs> nobody conquers, you know? And I think this is, um, this is actually really important because it shows us some of the roots of that distorted masculine yeah. in all of us, not just in men, yeah. you know, that just thinks if I work hard enough, I'm going to get control over life and over reality. And okay. we can't. Right. It's like, I was horrified to see that the, you know, because the, the pinnacle point of materialism is, is, is scientism, you know, and the idea mm -hmm. we've just got to battle with the unknown. And if we have enough money and resource and enough microscopes, we will, we will find out. Right. right. And, right. The, and I, and, and I was horrified to see, to notice the other day that the, the slogan, the motto of Pfizer is science will win. Wow. And I was like, I literally felt a shudder through my soul when I, read that. I was like, mm, yeah, it's just, it's just this, this like, and I haven't met a doctor yet that wasn't either afraid of death 
or yeah. touched by death at a young age. Yes. It's yes. like, you know, it, and I have a huge respect for medical science in loads of ways, of course, and amazing things they've done to, to, to protect and long life. And I believe that most of the intentions in most of the people involved in that work is an attempt to control and to serve and to avoid death. And the idea that enough money and knowledge will protect us from pain, which is ludicrous. But it's not, you know, easily, easily labeled as, as entities and as industries as evil, but they're actually full of people who are afraid, trying to establish control. Yeah. With a model which is which is uh, deeply flawed. Afraid of the goddess of reality, afraid of the reality of imminence and incarnation. And so in my, in my body of work, something happens when we turn towards the truth of the wildness of reality, when we have the courage to tremble before the goddess, when we have the courage to balance the brilliance of our knowing and our ability to articulate and grasp with the fact that we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen next. We are surfing, you know, this undulating aliveness that is the mother, that is just constantly blooming and dying and decaying and seeding and blooming and dying. And we are that too. So when we turn towards that, and we could use this metaphor for maybe relationships between men and women too. When we turn towards that and open our hearts to that, instead of trying to rise above it and control it and dominate it, right? There's a very sacred intimacy with life that starts to happen and a very sacred dance with life. And um, we could maybe call it, if we're gonna go with masculine archetypes, like you become the lover. The real lover that's like meeting her and dancing with her, right? And allowing yourself to be touched and be impacted by her. We need to restore the truth that the courage to be impacted by life is a strength, not a weakness. Right? To be touched, to be impacted, to be moved. Not there's, a, there's a courage. Yes, there's a courage in that. That's a, it's a strength. It's not a weakness, you know? I think that's the, the ultimate key. That's the mm -hmm. ultimate key to unlock the divine masculine and to, to heal man, you know? And that's what I'm feeling. Yes. That's what I'm exploring. Well, listen, I know you and I, we could talk for a long time on these subjects. <laughs> and maybe we should talk again soon. But um, I just, um, I want to thank you so much. It's yeah. been amazing. Your work is amazing. Your poetry is, is, is unbelievable. Thank you so and, much. Um, and yeah, what you're doing, what you're standing for and how you're standing and how yeah. you're dancing with it. I just really, really want to honor you and thank you for your work. Thank you so much. It's rare for me to really meet someone who, um, who gets it and gets me and gets where I'm coming from and can, and can meet me in these places. So I've just been so... Um, nourished and lit up by this and thank you so much for all that you're doing thank you all right yeah. well, we shall leave it there and uh, i'll put all of your links associated so anyone wants to connect with your work they will they will find you so thank you that's great all thank right. you so much. bye have a good evening you too